Welcome everyone to Business Calculus. This is going to be our first lesson in the course. And in the first three lessons, we're going to review some algebra topics. Um, algebra is very important and you'll see it weaved in throughout the course, uh, mixed in with the calculus topic. So it's really important that you have a good foundation for algebra. So if throughout the course you run into anything that you forget how to do from algebra, you just let me know and I will be sure to uh, review that with you. We're going to first start talking about relationships and functions. So a relation is a rule that pairs each element in one set called the domain with one or more elements from a second set called the range. And this is just a fancy way of saying that we have two sets of numbers or values and we are going to pair them together. So that's a relation. Now, what you need to know is a function is a very specific kind of relation. Every function is a relation, but not every relation is a function. Functions are a specific subcategory of relationships. A function is when you have a set of, we'll call it inputs. That's just another way to say domain. And a set of outputs. And each input is paired with only one unique output. So what sets a function apart from a relation is that just like a relationship, we have two sets, one input, one output, or you could call it the domain and range, however you want to state it. And one element from the first set is paired with an element from the second set. So that's a relationship, okay? Any pairing. But a function is specifically the way that it's matched up. For every input, it's only matched with one specific unique output. So in other words, you're not going to have two different y values that are paired with the same x value. So now there's different ways to show relationships and functions. There's different methods of doing that. There's a whole bunch of different ways, but the ones that we're going to really focus on is we have numerical And that's basically just when you list the pairs. So it could be in a T table, it could be using set notation. It's just when you see, visibly see all the pairs and how they're linked up. Another common method for representing a function is symbolic, or this is just a fancy way of saying a formula. And sometimes it's actually called a rule too. So this is just a fancy way of saying an equation. And then the last way is graphical. So this is pretty obvious. It's just a graph of the function. Okay, we're going to look at the first example. It says construct a table and a graph for the function. So just like we just talked about, this is the rule so this tells me what to do with the input to get the output. In other words, what do I do with x to get the y? And this is telling me I need to multiply by 8.5. This is your numerical version. This is your list of inputs and outputs and how they're matched up. So your x, y coordinates. And then this is your graphical representation. Now, I want you to keep in mind there's other ways to represent a function, but these are the most common. 
Okay, so we have to construct a table and graph the function. So for each of these x's, I'm going to plug in to this x right here and then get out my y value, which would be the pay. So we have the hours worked, which is the x. We do the rule, we work it out, and then we get the y value. Something also to pay attention to, and this is very important, a lot of times people just overlook it or skip it. This is telling us the domain. Now, if there's nothing stated for the domain, you can assume it's all real numbers for the x's. However, when you state it like this, where it's between two values, that's a restricted domain, so you don't want to go outside that interval. And now, let's specifically talk about domain and range. The domain is the set of all the inputs, and then you perform whatever rule is given to you and then you get out the range. The domain is the set of all the x's. Now keep in mind that depending on what you're talking about, it could be a different variable, like it could be t or r or something, depending on how the equation is set up. And then for the range, that's the set of all the y's. So now it says in this example, state the domain and range for the function that we just talked about. y equals 8.5x, where x falls between 0 and 40. Now, when you look at a domain, and you're trying to determine what the set of inputs are, is you want to consider, are there any values of x that if I plug it into my formula, am I going to run into a problem? What values of x can't I plug in? And then everything else is in the domain. So some restrictions that you need to consider. You can't divide by 0. So for example, if we have the function 1 over x, if I plug in 0 for x, using the function 1 over x, then that's going to give us an undefined value. So I can't plug in any values that would cause me to get a 0 in the denominator. A second rule is we can't have negative numbers, no negative numbers, under an even root. So meaning the square root the fourth root, the sixth root. Um, another one you want to consider is um, log functions. You can't plug in anything that would cause you to take the log of zero or to take the log of a negative number. So no zeros or negative numbers uh, for log. So these are the restrictions you need to take into consideration and pay attention to. Now, looking at this example, this is a nice easy one to start off with because as you see, this does not give me any restrictions that I'm concerned about. I can plug in any value of x in here and I'm not going to worry about getting zero in the denominator. I'm not going to worry about getting a negative number under an even root. And there's no logs in this equation that I'm concerned about. If this restriction wasn't there, then yes, definitely I can plug in anything I want. But now when we include that restriction, I have to make sure that I'm plugging in only values between 0 and 40 inclusive. We can include the 0 and the 40. Another way to write this using interval notation just a review, would look like this, right? The bracket means you're including, and the parentheses means you're not including. This notation here is called set builder notation. And it's just a fancy way of, again, stating the domain and range. This reads x, all x's, such that, this line means such that, that x is going to fall between 0 and 40, including 0 and 40. Now, if you look back up at the graph on the previous page, you'll see that my range 
All my Y's are between 0 and 340 and including 0 and 340. So this is how we're going to write out the range. Now, if I wrote this in interval notation, it would look like this. All different ways to write the same thing. Here's another way to represent a function, but it's not as popular. Um, so this is called mapping. And it's just another way to show how things are paired up. So this is the general statement. For any x that I plug in, and if you follow the line, you're going to get 8.5x. But if you plug in specific values, if I plug in 20, that's going to map it to 170. There's my pair. So the arrows are literally showing me what my pairs are. So this is 10 that's in the domain, and it's going to get paired with 85 because when I take 10 times 8.5, I get 85. Okay, another example, like says Kendra tosses a softball into the air with an underhand motion. The distance of the ball above her hand is given by the function in symbolic form as, because we're talking about time and height, the author of this question chose to use H and T. So in this case, T is like my X, so we'll call that the input and h is the output. It says h is the height of the ball and t is the time in seconds. You want to pay attention when you're reading an application problem how the function is defined and what the variables represent. Because if you're asked a question, then you'll know where to plug in the value that's given. So it says, Construct a table that gives the height of the ball at a quarter second intervals, starting with t equals zero and ending with t equals two. And then we're gonna graph the function. If we're doing it every 0.25 seconds, cause it says at quarter second intervals, these are the values of t that we're gonna put on our t table. Then we're gonna use those matched pairs to plot a graph for this situation. And remember, this is a restricted domain, so we're only going to plot between 0 and 2. Typically, when it's restricted like this, the author is telling you that the problem doesn't make sense to go outside that interval. We don't want to talk about negative time, so we stay above 0. And if we pick a number that's higher than 2, it's probably going to give me a negative height. So that also doesn't make sense. So this is the interval that makes sense for this question. All right, so when we make a T table, this is what we get here. So these are all of our inputs. We plug those in, and this is all the work done out. So we plug in zero for everywhere we see T, and we get out zero. We plug in one fourth and then we get out seven. So these are all the outputs for each of the inputs. Then when we graph it, we get this picture. And this is exactly why the author of the question didn't want to go past two or below zero. We don't want negative time when we're talking about the context of a problem. We don't wanna go out this way. And we don't wanna go out further this way because if we start plotting points bigger than two, we're gonna be, be below a height of zero, which also doesn't make sense. This is ground level, so we wanna make sure that we restrict our domain for this problem from zero to two. Now, what I wanna do is I'm gonna show you how you can make, let me go back up, whoops. So when we look back at the slide, this is a lot of work to do this by hand. And I know at this point in your math career that you are fully capable of plugging in values and evaluating. So I'm gonna show you a method um, on our GeoGebra calculator that you can set all of this up really fast and the, and the GeoGebra calculator will do the work for you so you don't have to worry about all this arithmetic. For each of your lessons in XYZ Homework System, 
there is a calculator option when you open up the assignment on the same page where it says start you'll see right underneath the start of the assignment it will have a calculator tab and you can click on this and this is what's going to open so this is really good um, this is just as good as a graphing calculator it can do all the same things the nice thing about this is that it's free online. So to create the same table without having to do all that arithmetic, we're gonna put in our formula. So we had 32x, um, and then it was minus 16x squared. Now we can use these arrows. Notice that my cursor is up next to the exponent by the two you can use these arrows at the bottom of the screen to get out of that um, superscript so that you're back down at normal level if you need to type anything else. All right, now that we have that in, this down in the bottom corner, you'll see the, uh, it looks kind of like a rectangle with a point on the side and then the X, that's your back button if you need to delete anything. And then the button below that is your enter button. So I'm going to choose the enter button to create that formula. And then what I can do to create the table, the three docs that are next to the formula, I'm going to just tap on that. And it says right at the top, table of value. So I'm going to click on that. And then I can set up what the table of values are gonna be, like what the steps are, and it's gonna go from what value to what value. So we're going from zero to two. And we wanted to do this in quarter seconds. So our steps, which is basically the same thing as saying our scale, is gonna be um, 0.25. Now when I hit okay, it'll make the, the table of values for me. So it's going to plug in 0 0.25, 0 0.5, etc. It's going to plug all that in, and then it's going to give me in the f of x column, that's our output column, all of the corresponding values. And I did it all at once without having to do all those crazy calculations. Now, you can obviously see the graph next to this. You can um, drag it, you can grab it and drag it around. You can adjust the scaling on here just by dragging it around. Another thing I wanna show you real quick is that um, this bar here, if you're not, if you don't need to use the graph, but you need space in that algebra area, you can drag this and make it bigger if you're doing something with a longer equation and you need to see it better. So you can drag this back and forth so that you can have the space that you need. So when you put in your symbolic representation, that's under the algebra option here on the left side where it says algebra with the calculator. You can also use this to evaluate a single value of x. If I didn't need to make a whole table, but I just wanted to say, see what, f of 1.2 was. I click on the next line on an empty line. I can go to ABC menu and I can put F and then I go back to the one, two, three menu, the regular keypad and do F of 1.2 close parentheses. And when I hit enter, it will give me that value of 15.36. So once you have that function defined, you can evaluate it point by point if you'd like to. So back to our slides. Um, if you have a graphing TI calculator and you prefer to use that rather than the GeoGebra, you'll see um, I'll have these slides that are taken from the book that show you how to do them on the TI-83 or TI-82. So you can follow the steps there for making a table. Okay, now let's talk about relations that are not a function. 
It says in this example, table four shows the prices of used Ford Mustangs that were listed in the local newspaper. The diagram in figure seven is called a scatter diagram. Uh, it gives a visual representation of the data in table four. Why is this data not a function? So when we look at this table, this is our numerical representation. When we look at that, re let's remember again what a function is. A function is defined by, by taking one value from the input and matching it with only one output. That's it. So every output is only matched with one input. Now, when you look at this, I have 2010 multiple times here matched with different Y values. So for 2009, I have multiple uh, Y values for the same input. For 2008, we only have one, so that's good. For 2007, I have two. Now it only has to fail at one point. In this case, it fails at multiple points. I have 2010 that's matched with more than one Y. I have 2009 that's matched with more than one Y. And I have 2007 that's matched with more than one Y. But it only has to fail in one place for this to happen. So let's look at these points here that will help summarize the most important stuff about looking at the difference between relations and functions. This first one says, any rule that assigns numbers from one set to, of numbers to another set is called a relation. So that's the big umbrella definition. Any kind of matching or pairing is called a relation. But if that rule makes the assignment so that no input has more than one output, then it is also a function. So this is what makes that relationship special as a function, that every x value is paired with only one y. So this is aimed at when we have our symbolic representation, because it's talking about the rule. When we're looking at a set of ordered pairs, we know that those are definitely relation. We have the matching pairs, but if none of the first coordinates of those ordered pairs is repeated, meaning I have X with one value of Y and then I see X for another value of Y, then that set of ordered pairs is also a function. We also know that every function is a relation because function is the special case of a relation, but not every relation is a function. So these statements are based on looking at it as an ordered pair or as some kind of formula or equation. Now, when we look at it graphically to try to determine if it's a function or not, that's when we start using the vertical line test. If a vertical line crosses the graph of a relation in more than one place, the relation cannot be a function. If no vertical line can be found that crosses the graph in more than one place, then the graph represents a function. So this is how you can check it graphically. So this is for ordered pairs and for equations. Okay, let's look at this example here. It says we're gonna sketch the graph of x equals y squared. So the solution says without going into much detail, we're gonna graph the equation x equals y squared by finding a number of ordered pairs that satisfy the equation, and then we're gonna plot those points, and then we're gonna draw a smooth curve that connects them. A table of values for x and y that satisfy the equation follows along with the graph of x equals y squared that's shown below. So here's the table. So what was chosen to plug in for x was 0, 1, 4, 9. What we got out was 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, and negative 3. This 1 for x here is paired with positive 1. 
but it's also paired with negative one. And that is because, let me show you up here. Here's our equation. If I plug in one for x and solve for y, there are two values of y that I can plug in, square it, and get out one. I could plug in one and square it and get out one. I could also plug in negative one and square it and get out positive one. If I, so that's just kind of intuitively looking at it, but if I were to actually go to solve it, I would have to square root both sides. But remember when you take the square root, you do plus or minus. So I would get y is equal to plus or minus the square root of one, which is just one. So when I plug in one for x, I'm getting out plus and minus one for y. So that's looking at it in terms of the equation and the table of values. But now if we look at it in terms of the vertical line test, anywhere that I draw a vertical line, it's gonna pass through that graph more than once. The only place that it's not gonna pass more than once is right here. If I draw my vertical line on the y-axis. And all it has to do is fail in one point. If it fails in one point, then it is not a function. The next example says graph the equation of y equals 1 over x. Now for the solution, the book says, notice that the, since y is equal to 1 divided by x, y is going to be positive when x is positive. So if I plug in a positive x, I get 1 over whatever that positive number is, which is positive. When I plug in a negative number, I'm going to get y is equal to 1 over a negative number, which is negative. So this is telling us that x and y is always going to have the same sign. Then next it says notice that the expression 1 over x will be undefined when x is 0 meaning that there is no value of y that corresponds to x equals 0. So that means x is not going to be in the domain. If I plug in 0, there's nothing that comes out for y. 1 over 0 is undefined. And just as a reminder, because sometimes people get this mixed up, 0 over 1 is equal to 0. Now, if sometimes you forget which one is which, you can just work backwards to remember how that works. So, for example, if I gave you 8 divided by 4, we know that that's 2 because we can work backwards and say 2 times 4 is equal to 8. But if I look at 1 over 0, what number would I multiply by 0 and get 1? That's never going to happen. That's why this is does not exist or undefined. But when I look at this, 0 times 1 is equal to 0 when we work backwards. This one works. So 0 over 1 is equal to 0. So just a quick reminder of the difference between 1 over 0 and 0 over 1. So now when we plot these points, and you can do this on your GeoGebra or on your graphing calculator if you don't want to do all that arithmetic. Um, but these are the points that you would come up with. And when you graph them, you get this. Notice this right here, zero is undefined, and so this is going to cause us to have a vertical asymptote there. So never will that function ever cross that vertical line, because if it does, then that means there's a value of y when x is zero. We know that that's not going to happen. There, a function can never cross the vertical uh, asymptote. However, there are cases when a function can cross a horizontal asymptote. So if I were to write out the domain for this, this means it's going on forever in both directions. This means it's going up and down forever in both directions. But I want to exclude the value x is equal to zero when I write my domain. If I'm using interval notation, then what you want to do is you want to look, since this is broken into two pieces, you want to look at each piece separately. So when I look at this first piece here that I just highlighted in green, 
When I write the domain for that piece, it's going to be from minus infinity up to zero, but not including zero. Now for the second piece that is not highlighted in green, I'm going to write that that's going to go from zero, x equals zero, all the way to positive infinity, not including either one of those. And then you put the union symbol in between. So if I pick any value of x from the function, it could lie on the first interval or it could lie on the second interval. In this next example, it says that we're going to graph y is equal to the square root of x and y is equal to the cubed root of x. So we're going to see the difference between these two graphs. So looking at this important note down here, Recall that in one of the previous slides when we first started talking about and reviewing domains that I listed some restrictions that you needed to look out for when you're trying to find the values of x that are in the domain. And one of the restrictions was that you cannot take an even root of a negative number. When you do that, you're going to get i's, and i's are not within the real coordinate plane. Those are in the complex plane. So if I try to take the square root or the fourth root of a negative number, that number is not going to be on the real coordinate plane. So we would say that it's undefined or it doesn't exist. So when I try to find the domain for y is equal to the square root of x, I know that x has to be greater than or equal to zero. Whatever is underneath here has to be greater than or equal to zero. So that is going to be my domain. Now writing that in interval notation, it would look like this. It would start at zero and I would include zero because I can take the square root of zero and it will go all the way to positive infinity. It's unbounded. Now, when you plug in all those values of x that are positive or equal to zero, all the values of y that you would get out, so I'll write this as x here, or domains, all the possible values that you would get out for y is the same thing, right? Because no matter what I plug in for x, I would get out zero or some positive number. Now, when we graph the square root, Here's our tables. So the author decided to try some negative numbers and show that that's undefined. So here's the picture of the square root of x. And as you notice, no negative numbers. It starts here at zero, and it goes from zero to infinity. It's unbounded. Now, with odd roots, I can take the root, if it's odd, of a negative number. So for example, if I take the cubed root of negative 27, and we're looking for what that value is, we're basically looking for what would I multiply three times to get negative 27? What would be in here that's exactly the same thing to get negative 27? Now, because there are three of them, if I put a negative number in there, because it's three factors, it's gonna end up being negative. So I could say that the answer is negative 3. This becomes positive, but then when you multiply it by the negative 3, you get negative 27. And that only works because this is odd. So my domain for this function, because I can plug in anything I want into the cubed root of x and not worry about any restrictions, my domain is going to be from minus infinity to infinity, or all real numbers. That's my domain. And then the same thing with my range. Even though it, it increases slowly, it's still increasing. It would be from minus infinity to infinity for the range as well. This table only shows specific values that we use to plot the table, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these are only the values of x that are going to show up in the domain. OK, last topic that we're going to talk about is function notation. So we had that example, the first example in this lesson, f of x is equal to 8.5 times x. When you see that notation, whatever that letter is, that's going to be the name of your function. So it could be g, it could be star, it could be whatever you call it. 
Most of the time we see it as F because it stands for function, but it can be anything that you want. What we plug in here was is the input. So it's part of the domain. And whatever you get out is the output. And again, we use X's and Y's because that's what we're familiar with and that's what's intuitive. However, keep in mind that that could be different letters but still stand for the input and the output. So here's our mapping example. And they're just showing certain values how this works. So your domain is this and you map it to your range. So wherever the arrow goes, that's what it's being paired with. So 10 is being paired with 85 and we're getting those values from the rule. Now, if we change the rule, we wanna call it a different name. So this is called g of x, and they're using 9.5x as a second example. So when we map that, we're gonna get different values, but you can see what it's mapped with or what it's matched with. Now down here, it says x, and then it has that funny symbol that looks kinda of like an e, but that is a symbol for an element of. And then specifically a set. So this is saying X is a value that's in, or X is a member of the domain. F of X is a member of the range. This is your output. So it should be part of your range. Okay, so again, it's showing you in a different way the domain of f is the inputs, so that's going to be along here, along your x-axis. And your y, which is equal to the f of x, as an equation, that would be the rule, but as a single value that comes out, that's going to be your output. So that's going to be the values along here, and that would be your output. Now here's an example of how you would use the notation. If I input x is 20, that's my input, x is 20, my answer or my output would be 170. So looking at 20 on the x-axis, I get out 170 on the y-axis. Okay, so now clearing the graph so that it's not cluttered, we did this example that's already written on the graph, evaluate the function at x is equal to 20, and we got 170. Looking at another example, if I said evaluate the function at x is equal to 30, if I come over here to 30 and come up, that would be 250. So that's my y value. But you could also be asked this in reverse. I could say, what is the value of x when y, or your output, is 250? That would mean your x is unknown. So this means find the value of x when y is 250. And you would just have to look backwards. So I would say, well, here's 250, and I would come across this way and look down to see what it matches up with. So in this case, I would say x is 30. So you can be asked working in reverse too. Now, when you're evaluating functions using a rule, you're literally just finding whatever that value of x is and plugging it into the rule or the equation and then using the order of operations to find that value. So f of five means plug in x is five. So plug in x is five there. So I get four times five is 20, minus one is 19. Now be careful because if you're using more than one function, it's gonna have different names. So you wanna make sure that you're plugging it into the right one. Since I have g of five here, I wanna make sure that I plug five into g. So I plug in x is five into g and I get 25 plus two is 27. So if you're working with more than one function, pay attention to which one you're supposed to plug it into based on the name of the function. Now, it doesn't matter what is inside as your input. Whatever is in there, you literally replace all your independent variables with whatever is inside here if you can calculate it, if it's a number, then you calculate it. 
If it's a letter or represents some unknown, then all you can do is plug it in and maybe simplify the expression a little bit, but you can't really calculate a value from it. So when I ask you to find f of z, I put z in for x, and all I can do with that is 4z minus 1 because I don't know what z represents. Same thing with f of a here. This one here I want to spend a, a little bit of time on. Um, and there's no difference in how you do this if it's an expression that has more than one term. You still want to plug it in. Let me erase this. You still want to plug it in wherever you have x or whatever your independent variable is labeled as. You still want to plug that in. And if there's more than one, you want to make sure you plug it in all those places. Because it's more than one term, and if you start squaring things or you have a rational function, when you simplify it, it can get a little bit messy. Now these examples are pretty simple. So I plug in a plus three into f of x, so I get four times a plus three, and this is where it used to be x, and then I subtract one. I really highly suggest that whenever you plug in an expression, you make sure you put parentheses around it so that if you have to distribute, you don't forget. So here's a common mistake. So don't do this, four times a plus three, and then minus one. If you don't write parentheses around it, that could confuse you and you might forget that you need to distribute and you just might do 4a and then plus two because you look at the three minus one separately. It's really important to, to maintain those order of operations so that you don't make that mistake. Uh, make sure you put parentheses around anything that has more than one term. So here you would distribute the four, so I would have four a plus 12, and then carry down the minus one. So multiplication comes first, and then we subtract. So we have four a plus 12 minus one, and then I combine those and make that an 11. Now over here, where I plug in a plus three in for g, we wanna make sure that we know a plus three is being squared that means we're taking a plus three times a plus three. And here's a common mistake that I see for this one. So a common mistake I see when you square something or you raise anything to um, a power. So common mistake. Is I see this a lot. This is not true. A plus three squared means you multiply it twice. You have A plus three times A plus three, and this is where you have to distribute twice. You take the A times the A and the three, and then you take the three times this, the A and the three. So it's not gonna be A squared plus nine. You're missing the middle term by doing that. So keep that in mind also when you are plugging in an expression. So when it's expanded and it's done correctly, when you take a plus three and square it, you have a squared plus six a plus nine, and then when you add two, the nine and the two make 11. Now there's a way you can evaluate on your calculator. Uh, here are the instructions on how to do that if you like using your TI graphing calculator. I did show you already how to do this on GeoGebra, but I'll give you a quick refresher. When you see that little dot and you plug in your function, so I put in f of x is equal to, just make something up, x squared plus seven. Then you hit enter and on the next line, you plug in f of say three, if you wanna evaluate x at three. So once you hit enter, when you do f of three, it will tell you the answer. So all of what we talked about can be applied to word problems. And now this is just a quick self check. So these are the things that we went over um, in the lesson that you should be able to explain to me once you practice this with the homework. You should be able to answer what is a function. You should be able to answer um, that the range of a function is associated with the output. And for part C here, you should be able to identify or explain that the domain is associated with the input. And for part D, you should be able to read 
function notation so that I know when I look at f of 6 is equal to 0, I know that x is 6, y is 0, and I can plot that point on the graph. And even more than that, this is actually one of the intercepts. You should be able to recognize that too. If you have either x is 0 or y is 0, that's going to be one of your intercepts. These are not all the points that we talked about in the lesson, but these are some big ones that you should, let's say, take away from the lesson.